Hi, this is Lori from the Swamp School. Today we're going to talk about water quality, which really encompasses a lot. But for now we're going to focus on the cycles of water and the cycles of nutrients throughout the water. So let's get started learning. This is a picture of the water cycle you've probably seen a million times before. But today we're going to talk about each critical step and how they are all related to water quality. What begins the process? The sun, of course, because it starts the flow of energy. This, in turn, begins the cycling of water, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, carbon, and oxygen in and out of the atmosphere, and the hydrosphere and lithosphere, by the way. So the water cycle begins with the sun, which evaporates the water in the oceans, and the water becomes water gas. The gas causes the air to have more pressure because it's more dense, so it rises into the atmosphere where there isn't as much pressure. As it rises, it cools, then condenses back into a liquid form, and it forms clouds. When the clouds get too filled with water droplets, it begins to precipitate, and depending on the temperature in the atmosphere, the water droplets will fall to the ground in one form or one state or another. As water evaporates from the oceans, or if the oceans freeze solid, the salt content, or salinity, of the ocean increases. The opposite is true when it precipitates, or if the ice melts. The average salinity of ocean water is 35 parts per thousand, whereas in coastal waters, polar seas, and near the mouths of large rivers, the salinity is lower. So what happens to the rest of the water as it precipitates from the clouds? Water in the atmosphere comes from evaporation from bodies of water as well as transpiration from plants. When precipitation falls, some of the precipitation lands on tree canopies that again evaporates into the atmosphere. The precipitation can run off the ground, rooftops, pavements, etc., into streams, rivers, lakes, or estuaries. The precipitation that reaches the ground can also be absorbed into the soil and become groundwater. The ability of the soil to absorb and retain water depends on the permeability of the soil. When we mentioned rooftops, pavement, etc. before, these are called impermeable materials. Let's talk about runoff. Where does it go? All the runoff from precipitation will drain from a higher elevation to a lower elevation. The lower elevation is normally where rivers, streams, and estuaries are formed. All of the drainage area for a river is called the river basin, or watershed. The water from the rivers flow into estuaries, eventually making it back into the oceans. When you think of it, we all live in a river basin because we don't live in the river. The runoff from the land we live on drains to a river, lake, or an estuary, and again makes its way back to the ocean. Therefore, our actions on land affect water quality in quantities far downstream. We rarely think about how our actions affect our water, but now you know it does. Let's talk about water quality next and how we measure it. There are physical characteristics of a body of water that can be measured to determine the health of a water system. These physical characteristics are temperature, turbidity, which is how clear the water is, and the movement of water. Then there are chemical variables that can also be measured. These chemical additives include dissolved oxygen and other gases, the pH or the acidity of the water, the amount of nitrates and phosphates, and the amount of salt in the water. Water that is safe to drink comes from our freshwater systems and is called potable water, which is different from safe water, that is water that can be used for bathing or cleaning. The Environmental Protection Agency sets maximum levels for the 90 most common contaminants in our water. This is a normal part of public health and safety of our freshwater resources. So how do these physical and chemical parameters affect our fresh water? First, the temperature of the water determines the type of organisms that can live in it. Warm water dissolves more chemicals, but it dissolves less gas. 
you know that gases are less soluble in warmer temperatures, whereas solids, the warmer the temperature, tends to make them, make them more soluble. So gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide will become less soluble in water as the temperature increases for the organisms that live there. Let's talk a little more about dissolved oxygen and other gases. Dissolved oxygen is called DO for short. This parameter is the amount of oxygen available for aquatic organisms and chemical reactions that take place in the water. How does oxygen and carbon dioxide get dissolved into the water? It does so through diffusion of the oxygen and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and from the waste products of photosynthesis occurring in the water. Dissolved oxygen in fresh water is used by all forms of aquatic life, so it's a good measure of the health of the water system. When dissolved oxygen gets too low, aquatic life that is sensitive to dissolved oxygen either moves away, gets sick, or dies. This would not be a healthy water system. Next, we'll discuss the pH of water as a measure of health. First off, pH is measured on a scale of 0 to 14, where 0 to about 6.9 is acidic or carries excess H plus ions. From 7.1 to 14, the water is basic or carries excess OH negative ions, and a pH of 7 is neutral, neither acidic or basic. The pH is a diagnostic reading for the health of a water system because it controls many chemical and biological processes that occur there. pH affects the chemical reactions of chemicals in the water, like iron, aluminum, ammonia, or mercury. Sometimes the impact is amplified or diminished depending on the pH, but it certainly has an impact on most reactions. For example, when the water becomes acidic, it can make the chemicals and metals in the water more poisonous than it would normally be. Excess carbon dioxide in the water also lowers pH, making water more acidic. As we experience global warming and our levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increases, so does the concentration of carbon dioxide in our oceans and waters. We are seeing the effects of this now in organisms that live in our water. We should definitely talk about nitrogen and phosphorus in the water system and in the soil. We know that plants need chemical compounds of nitrogen and phosphorus as part of their food for growth. However, in our drinking water, nitrogen and phosphorus pose possible health risks to humans if the concentration of these elements are not controlled. Nitrogen gets deposited in our waterways through excess fertilizer runoff, septic tank leakage, sewage, and erosion of natural deposits. Whereas phosphorus gets into our waterways, from human and animal waste and laundry, cleaning, and industrial products. Excess of these chemicals in our waters cause uncontrolled algal blooms, sometimes called red tide, that are deadly to fish and other organisms that live in the water. Next, we'll talk about turbidity or how clear the water is and how it affects the health of our fresh water. High turbidity can be associated with organic pollution and unhealthy conditions. High turbidity in surface water can lead to an increase in temperatures. It can affect dissolved oxygen and can even cause illness in aquatic organisms. As you can reason, the temperature will increase because turbidity darkens the water with solids. The solids in turn have a lower specific heat than water, hence the temperature increase. Remember, specific heat is the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of a substance. But it's time to talk about an indicator of water quality that's easy to collect and identify in our waters. Okay, I saved the best for last. And the last way we can assess the quality of our fresh water is to monitor bioindicators like macroinvertebrates. As I said early, the, earlier, these organisms are easy to collect and identify. And the types of, and quantities of macroinvertebrates can tell us a lot about the quality of the water. This is because certain macroinvertebrates are sensitive to pollution. You won't catch them in polluted water, while others are not sensitive to pollution at all and will be an indicator of poor water quality. The organisms that are sensitive to pollution are the ones you want to see in your water system. Also, the variety of macroinvertebrates signals good water quality, whereas a few of a certain type of macroinvertebrate 
is an indicator of poor water quality. Let's summarize what we talked about today. We talked about the water cycle and what potable water is as opposed to safe water. We described water runoff. We also said that we all live in a river basin and our actions where we live could impact our water quality. We also said that dissolved oxygen in water is good. Is, <clears throat> excuse me, is good. Too much carbon dioxide is bad, as well as excess nitrogen and phosphorus is bad. The temperature affects our water quality, as well as the pH and the turbidity. Lastly, we talked about how macroinvertebrates can tell us a lot about the quality of our water, and they're fun to catch and identify. That concludes water quality from the standpoint of the water cycle. I hope you learned a lot and understand the interactions and impacts of our actions on the systems we live in. Have a great swampy day.